Music. Motion. Uh, generating. Uh, attention. Today we're going to talk about Charles Manson. This has been a long-awaited uh, video for a lot of us. Greg, you want to tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so this is the first long format interview he was given that he gave after he was in prison 10 years earlier for the death of nine people. And if you don't know the Manson story, go back and look. It was cult like. He had people who went out and killed nine people in Los Angeles and caused a wave of terror. When you and Mel write a book, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to try to bring out in your book? I never even thought of anything like that. I'd have to give that some thought. I was doing this on Mel's request. Mm -hmm. He wanted to write the book. I don't particularly care to explain nothing to you. I don't look up at you for any reason to bring my report card home anymore. Does that make sense? Well, no, I, what I'm trying to, to find out is what would you like to bring out in the book that can teach other people? What can you teach other people? That's what I'd like to know. What yeah. do you think you can teach other people? That's what I'd like to know, too. I know how to be reborn and start all over. I start all over. I don't start all over with the same old, same old. I just start all over. Even though I might be old, I'm still brand new every day because I do one day at a time, just like that old convict used to tell me. Isn't that what he used to say, man? One day at a time. So I've learned to live my life in one day at a time. All right, Chase, what do you got? What you just saw right here is a super common behavior in cult leaders all around the world. They repeat questions back to their followers, then use this weird silence and repetition to pretend that there's some actual wisdom in the remarks there. It's kind of like a shell game where they're playing hide the intellect, except there is not much. And this question really got him. We've already established uh, he's going to He's going to emotional accessing this downright for a baseline, which is pretty unusual uh, for his baseline. And you can see him dive back down to that downright eye position several times, which is emotional. And he's repeating phrases and just par uh, kind of parroting this fabricated wisdom that he used to build his following. And he's saying we're reborn and then we start all over. He's uncomfortable with the silence here. His blink rate, which is how often we blink, it's a signal of stress, goes way up right there. And he is, I think, lost. So he's likely just retreating back to what worked with his followers, which is just repeating himself using broad concepts, pauses. And he's stressed to the point where he needs social confirmation from somebody else in the room, which is uncharacteristic for him here. And I built a pretty comprehensive list of a bunch of factors that made this man who he was and how he gained his following. And as we go, I'm going to drop a few of these in here. The first one is a neglected childhood. It was uh, very unstable and uh, very neglectful. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of the best examples of the organism that doing what made it successful. This guy is two layers. One layer is the crazy little nut job in prison because he's a small man and he's been in the system his entire life. So the easiest way to keep people off of you, there's actually in Merle Haggard's book, a guy called Fred who took excrement and rubbed it all over him to keep people off him. The other good example is be crazy. Nobody wants to deal with crazy. And he did a lot of violent things even in prison. When he first comes in, he's got his, wide, his legs wide open. That's just habit for him, I think. As he's thinking, I th see not just emotional but emotional and kinesthetic. And I think the reason is because he's actually trying to come up with an answer and you've hit him somewhere that matters when he's concentrating. Then he turns and looks straight down the pipe, straight down the camera. I don't need to explain nothing to you. That's him 
talking to the American public, not to the guy he's there with, because he's been in captivity for nine murders, never pulled the trigger on anyone, but he was just as guilty as those guys where he was guilty of conspiracy and was, I think he got nine murder one charges that stuck. The smile with him is condemning and disdain. Look at the sides of his mouth come back as he does that. And that's, in my opinion, I would call that the the uh, bless your heart as a gesture. Southern women go bless your heart, meaning, you know, something's wrong with you, you simpleton, that kind of thing. He's doing it as a gesture. And then he does a, that teaching face where he's looking to see if you get it when he says, I started all over because he's talking about every time he comes out of prison and comes back and we'll hear him talk about it more. Then you're going to find that he is he refers to each of those as a, as a new start and a new person. The last part that he has is this guru. And all he did, and you can listen, pay real close attention to him. He's spouting pop culture and he used drugs and pop culture and tying into things. Remember, this is the hippie era when everybody was about about unplugging and not being part of the system. So he's using a lot of language from hippie pop culture in those days. And then one of the best things you can do, if you've ever been around with people who smoke a lot of dope, and I don't mean like just sitting around and having a little bit of it here or there, they have crazy conversations that are disjointed and don't make a lot of sense to you if you're not one of them, but make perfect sense to them because their synapses are firing differently than yours. And he was feeding people all kinds of hallucinogens and everything else. So if it sounds close to rational, it is. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And we'll find out later on how um, how his philosophies literally don't they don't make any sense. I mean, there's philosophy that makes sense. And and his is an absolute dog's dinner of all kinds of uh, psychology, philosophy, ontology. I mean, everything all mashed together in a, in just nonsense. And not because he's he's mad in some way, just because he's rubbish. He's he, like he's no good at it. But in the right circumstances at the right time, uh, you know, in the right uh, context, it, it could sound very convincing to the right people. And we'll find out as well the kind of how he how he will what he punctures in people in order to get their attention uh well he's getting attention right now because he's literally taken the high ground he's that kind of person that when when he comes into a group of people who are sitting on chairs he would turn his chair around the other way and sit on it backwards i don't know whether he actually did that but i imagine he did because here he is on this what i would call a pew and he hasn't sat down on it he seems to be sitting high on it in some way later on he'll maneuver around that he's mirroring uh the um the interviewer there but in a Kind of an odd way, you know, almost not quite uh, steepling there, but he's found something to do with his fingers, which is a little bit tough and and eccentric uh, to do. But the interviewer is there like that as well. I think the cadence that he has, the rhythm that he has is in order to mirror the considered self-reflective thoughtfulness of the interviewer. The interviewer has a certain uh let's say almost therapeutic certainly uh philosophical style to him i think he's trying to mirror that back uh as well scott what do you got on this one all right i, I was opening up with that class hands thing mark because it looks so odd it's mm -hmm. so it's so out of place and i agree he's, he's mirroring it somewhat in that with that guy uh, and overall his body language is smooth and it's intentional um, and I think this is the, this may be the mildest interview he ever did. And I think the reason being is he hasn't quite figured out how to use TV or interviews to uh, his advantage yet. He's just now putting all that together. And, and, and I think this is the most real him that we see throughout his uh, career in prison when he does interviews and things. I think this is the real guy pretty much we're seeing. Looks like he might be on some kind of. Uh, something to help keep him calm because the the looks he has looks like he's on a depressant uh i could be wrong but he sure looks that way to me um and keep keep in mind this is all a show as we go through this this is even though he hasn't got it all quite figured out yet chase was talking about how he's he's basically a cult leader and that's what he's doing he's keeping back and he's kind of reading what's happening deciding what he's going to do making decisions about what's going to happen next 
And uh, I think throughout this uh, series of videos, we're going to hear him pulling from different philosophies. Not that he's read these philosophies. He's just heard about them. He's heard people talk about them. And I'll show you why in a little while we know that. He's heard parts of them. And he's just he says one line from one part of philosophy and one thing from Buddhism. He'll say one thing from Christianity, one thing from something else. And he's just pulling lines from that and just throwing them in there like David Bowie would do when he'd write songs quite often. What he would do is get a bunch of of uh, different lines and things and you have them all cut up on different pieces of paper and he would move them around and see if it would help spark something to make sense for him. And he would write entire songs with just these little clips of different words from the newspaper or from magazines and things like that to come up with something that sounded a little bit different. And that's in a way is what's happening here. He's taking just clips and little parts of, of different philosophies and he throws them out there and tries to back them up with this thing. Like he's got all this knowledge that he hides behind, which is really nothing there at all. It's very thin. There's, there's nothing there. He just has the wording for some of these things. And I'll, I'll and from my point of view, I'll go into detail about how he uses that to his advantage as well in a few minutes. Okay. We good. Yeah. One of those tape replays. When you and Mel write a book, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to try to bring out in your book? I never even thought of anything like that. I'd have to give that some thought. I was doing this on Mel's request. Mm -hmm. He wanted to write the book. I don't particularly care to explain nothing to you. I don't look up at you for any reason to bring my report card home anymore. Does that make sense? Well, no, I, what I'm trying to, to find out is what would you like to bring out in the book that can teach other people? What can you teach other people? That's what I'd like to know. What yeah. do you think you can teach other people? That's what I'd like to know, too. I know how to be reborn and start all over. I start all over. I don't start all over with the same old, same old. I just start all over. Even though I might be old, I'm still brand new every day because I do one day at a time, just like that old convict used to tell me. Isn't that what he used to say now? One day at a time. So I've learned to live my life in one day at a time. You really are. But in your philosophical talk, a lot of people won't, it'll go right over their heads. That's what I'm trying to say. Put it so they can understand it in, in lay language. Can we do that? Well, it's sad all over, really. You know, uh, it's hard for me to express how much sadness that I've went through to reach this point of understanding that I'm now talking to you from. <laughs> um, how are you going to help somebody that don't want help? Will Hit them in the head and make them do it. Will your book do that? Will you try? Will I try? To explain that. Will I try to help you people destroy me some more? Is that what you're saying? No. That's what I'm doing here. Will your book help children? Um, help parents? I don't know whether it would help anyone. I've never thought about that. You guys would have to show me what help is so I'd know what it is. You teach me, I'll learn. I'm just a little kid in mine. See, I've been in jail 30 some years. I never lived in your world outside. I'm like a little kid out there. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think the interviewer is trying to bait him in here, hook him in here. Uh, your philosophy will go over their heads. 
uh, put it in lay language. So he's he's trying to raise up, I'll say it, status, trying to raise up the subject status here in order to get him to talk uh, what we will find out is just utter nonsense, as, as Scott was rightly saying there. Uh, open crotch display there, so big, bold, taking up space, um, barriered arm over the side there to, to to rub on the chin. Again, it seems like an act of, hmm, I'm really thinking about this. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, other than what I think Scott was saying there, which is, you know, he's considering, how am I going to play this? Where am I going to go with this? You know, everything is, is an event right now for him to try and manoeuvre and manipulate I'm not sure there's many ideas of the past and the future here. He's very much somebody in the manipulation of of now. Um, but playing the role of the innocence there, innocence not quite knowing, but laughs a couple of times, uh, just, I think, to give that feeling of superiority that he knows, and he'll say this later on, he knows, he knows more than anybody else. He's withholding, you know, deep knowledge here i think there is a moment there of him pretending to wipe tears away before he says well it's sad all over really again a huge a huge act uh, greg what do you think what do you got on this one yeah yeah a couple of things but one thing what you're calling status i call pride and ego up because of my background pride and ego up is when i stroke your ego and make you look better feel better but 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 Manson's not buying it at all. Manson's that amusement in his face is like, oh, that was a wooden attempt. Oh yeah, I got gotcha. you, because he's trying to stroke his ego and make him come out and say stuff. But this guy's street smart. If Manson's smart about anything, it's about how to manipulate and get his way around people. People would say he's charismatic because he plied them with drugs and did whatever it took. He also was friends with some of the Beach Boys, with Neil Young, with a whole bunch of people. So in his life, he managed to wedge himself into places somehow. This. But we're all we're all going to be products of our environment. And this interviewer is old guard kind of guy. He's been around a long time and he's trying what worked with other people, not with a criminal who also has hippie kind of mindset. So he's kind of an outsider to it. I think the beard grooming is likely his baseline because things that we do all the time just become part of who we are. But he, I call that the philosopher's perch, Mark, when he's doing this. He's sitting there waiting for you to ask him the right question. And if he would have just said, tell me about this instead of trying to stroke his ego. I think he probably would have gotten more out of him. There's not a whole lot going here. I, the only thing I would say, Scott, I thought to start with maybe he was drugged as well, but his grooming and his movement is animated. His speech isn't, which makes me wonder, is he intentionally being kind of contained because he knows that he will be perceived better? Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. But his eyes look a little bit. His eyes don't look drugged up, but they're a little squinty for for to make me think that he might be straight up but he may be you know i don't know who knows uh i agree with the mark the crying is fake that nobody sniffs in like that it's just, <laughs> that's too big a deep uh, unconcerned sniff i guess the best way to put it and the thing is about that philosopher's uh setup greg he's also set himself up above this guy on the bench he's sitting on yep. the yeah he's sitting up there looking down at him talking to him like that which of course you would expect from someone who's holding court which he is in a way, in that situation, the guy can't go anywhere because he's there to ask him questions. Um, and that's the speaking slow, slowly part. I agree with you. That's part of uh, he's still trying to decide what's happening here, trying to get a handle on, on what's happening, trying to get a feel for the way it's going. Um, seeing a little bit of, of adapting with that with the hands, with the clasped, clasped hands a little bit. And I think you're right, Greg. I think that beard stroking and goof around with his mouth and all that, I think that's part of his baseline, which we see throughout this, except in one or two little spots where it's actually adapting, but I don't think it's here. Chase, what do you got? Uh, so y'all covered a lot of the behaviors here, but specifically there's one spot in here that says, how are you going to help somebody that don't want help? This is another great, beautiful cult leader line of just a nonsense question that I think he genuinely believes is pretty profound and deep. So, so there's this thing of circular logic and ridiculous cult leader speak. Just take something simple and easy to understand, then pretend it's deep and mysterious. And vulnerable people will hear this and think they're dumb for not getting this super deep core message that the guru's trying his absolute best to simplify for you, to dumb it down for you. So we're seeing his increased blink rate here again. 
in response to being questioned and what I think is a genuine struggle with his internal identity and how he's trying to manage his perception on camera. So the next thing is abuse. He had a whole lot of abuse uh, growing up and uh, really shapes our lives. I've studied neuroscience for about 12 years now. And this, in especially in childhood, changes your brain, changes the physical structure of your brain. And it's almost a, a permanent shift. One of those tape replays. You really are. But in your philosophical talk, a lot of people won't. It'll go right over their heads. That's what I'm trying to say. Put it so they can understand it in, in lay language. Can we do that? Well, it's sad all over, really. You know, uh, it's hard for me to express how much sadness that I've went through to reach this point of understanding that I'm now talking to you from. <laughs> um, how are you going to help somebody that don't want help? Will Hit them in the head and make them do it? Will your book do that? Will you try? Will I try? Explain that. Will I try to help you people destroy me some more? Is that what you're saying? No. That's what I'm doing here. Will your book help children? Um, help parents? I don't know whether it would help anyone. I've never thought about that. You guys would have to show me what help is so I'd know what it is. You teach me, I'll learn. I'm just a little kid in mine. See, I've been in jail 30-some years. I never lived in your world outside. I'm like a little kid out there. Will your life story help somebody else to understand how to proceed? If it was possible to present everything that's came down in the last few years in the proper perspective, it would be advantageous to other people, I would imagine. But if they had eyes in their head and they could see under the bed, they'd see that the heads of lead and eyes of wood. It doesn't really matter because rubber fingers is taking the hand off into the universe anyway. The level of comprehension that you hold in your mind is only taught to you by a school book that's in a sorority house. My father jumps off the Second World War in the ruptured ducks that were in the little pins and the buttons in Section 8 in the nut wards and all the people that have gone crazy. Your father was crazy? My father was all men that I've ever met in prison. Mel was one of my fathers. Creepy Carpus is another. I learned something okay. from everyone. <laughs> the captains, the wardens, I never missed anybody. I learned as much as I could from everybody I could get a hold of. And I've never met anybody that I couldn't learn something from. But now that I have learned what I've learned, I don't think you people want to know what I know. You wouldn't like it. Why? Well, because it's not very nice. Well, why? Because the people that you let run your lives aren't very nice. The people that govern you, the people that tell you people what to do, they're not good people. <laughs> All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to, you're going to have to bleep this because this is a house philosopher all day, every day. This guy has no clue what he's talking about. But if he makes his language dense enough, if he makes his language dense enough, then other people can't understand it. So he tries to complex, complexify his language so it's harder to understand. And that's what cult leaders do best. Chase and I both were part of cults when we were very young, meaning we went through basic training or boot camp. And there was a cult leader in there who made a very complex thing for you to understand. And the only way you're allowed to get food and sleep and all those things is when that cult leader saw that you were starting to buy into the game. So we were indoctrinated by instructors, drill instructors, and we turned into little military folks. We came in off the street looking like Charles Manson maybe, but came out of there looking like we do now. So what happens is they're putting pressure on you to conform. That pressure is not by them, it's usually by somebody else and all that Maslow to get to the top. So the more complex they make this language, the harder it is for you to get to. Think about, I'll just give you one example of how hard that can be. Imagine being a medieval person walking into a place where people spoke Latin and they owned this magic building 
Imagine how powerful that was to change the way you behaved. So now this is what these guys are doing on a smaller scale. He's got a whole bunch of BS language in there around heads of lead. And then I love seeing him stumble when he gets to eyes of wood and that one single shoulder shrug, like I have no clue what I'm saying is just beautiful. And then he raises that hand to testify. And I got me in my nose, preach it brother. Cause he starts to shift like some kind of a Southern Baptist cadence to his speech. It's beautiful. And he rolls off all this chaff and redirect his father's in the 101st Airborne. When he talks about ruptured ducks, that's the emblem for the 101st Airborne. He's a screaming eagle. And in popular culture, it was called ruptured ducks. I, look, and when he's even doing that, I love that he reaches up and touches his collar because he's talking about something tangible. But he's just dragging in anything he can, anything he can. I, look, at the end of that, he does that other, that bless your heart and a smile again, and then his eyelids flutter for punctuation. This is in a big pile. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So let me just teach you how to be a cult leader really quick. Uh, you heard him make these little rhyming words using vague language and then almost make no sense at all with this comment about this rubber fingers. And uh, I think uh, so cult leaders often use this rhyming, ambiguous language as a tool to exert control over followers. And this can be explained by a few key principles here. First, there's something in psychology called the rhyme as reason effect. And this uh, mental error that we make as humans, uh, we tend to make this error because it suggests that statements that rhyme are perceived as more truthful. So rhyming makes a statement easier to remember and process, which tells our brain, oh, that must be some good data there. If you need an example of this, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Second, ambiguous or nonsensical language can create mental confusion or cognitive dissonance. And this increases the cognitive load on the listener, like how much we're thinking about trying to make sense of it. And this creates a little opening for the leader to insert ideas and thoughts without a lot of scrutiny. So it's a form of a, maybe a confusion technique where the leader obliterates the familiar, replaces it with weird, and makes uh, makes you more susceptible. Finally, unusual language can uh, serve to separate the cult from the outside world and kind of creates a unique little vocabulary that only members think that they understand. Like, uh, Greg, I think you mentioned it, just L all the LSD and crazy stuff. Uh, and they want to, now the people in the group want to avoid breaking the norms. Uh, the next factor in creating Manson is juvenile delinquency. I won't explain that. I'll just leave it on the table there. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, I think this non this is just rambling, but I think it's worked for him before, obviously, because he's got some people that were believing it with him. And uh, he's trying to sound like he's an intellectual. Like that first opening sentence, sentence talking about things being advantageous. I, I bet he doesn't even know what that means. I really don't think so. I really don't think so. Because his use of the word came, you know, instead of saying uh, it, everything's out of whack in his in his vernacular. His his grammar is just horrific. And, then, and like Chase was saying, he separates himself from everybody else by talking about all this uh, out there, these little parts of philosophies that he's talking about and pulls from. And then you get your own wording for those things, and that becomes common in that group. And that and and it's just like a huge click when you get a big when you get a cult going. Uh and I and I I'll tell you, I think this guy's an idiot. I think he's an idiot. I don't think there's any no two ways about it. And I don't think and he's not like the Dostoevsky idiot you know there's a book he wrote a, a novel he wrote called the idiot and it's about this fellow named mishkin he was a prince right and he was really nice and he's really good to everybody and everybody thought he was an idiot they didn't think he was very smart because he was so nice and all these intellectuals thought they were above him but they come to find out that's not true so i don't think he's that style of idiot i think he's a full-blown idiot mark what do you got Classic full-blown idiot. So, uh, Chase, to your point, first lesson, first rule of great political speech writing uh, is end your line with a rhyme, and it just has that that nature to it. If you, if, if at least you could end on a rhyme, 
you know, the audience know when to to applaud or stand up. And it's a great signal that something significant has happened. And I think you're right. He's playing into that. So um, there's uh, Greg, you're absolutely right. I, I was thinking, why am I? Why does he sound like a Southern preacher in my mind? I don't know enough yep. about Southern preachers. He does. But I know enough to go, I think he's doing a Southern preaching act. I think we'll find out maybe in the next video where that Southern preacher may well have come from, because this may be something of a new act for him or a nuance, a new nuance to his his act. Uh, but but on the whole, uh, you know, he's, he's classically kind of charismatic. But I think what's happening here, and he does it here, is, is he turns around the inquisition that's going on around him into an inquisition into government systems and their effect on people. Now, the reason he does that, I think, is because he is truly paranoid. I think he does have actual paranoia. But the benefit of that paranoia is that if he can move his paranoia adjacent to people's insecurities. So if he's truly paranoid about government systems, which I think he he, he is, if he can go, well, you know, they're, they're, they're hiding stuff from us, aren't they? If, if, if you have somebody who feels stuff is being hidden from them, just in anywhere in their life, it's adjacent enough, especially whether, when it's with his passion of clinical paranoia that they'll go this guy's talking the truth he knows how it really is they're hiding stuff from us well yes stuff is being hidden from everybody all the time in all kinds of of ways you you can't see everything i mean just most stuff in the universe is hidden from you but if you've got a paranoid around you who will who will hammer at that idea and you are vulnerable enough he will find that insecurity and i think that's what he's doing here just just touching at adjacent subjects to people's insecurity my guess is is that's how he found his disciples by being well they were they were runaways in 1969 haight ashbury right they, right. they automatically don't trust the government. So yes, it's easy. Absolutely. So somebody out there going, going, well, because they're, they are the, the, you know, the big grand story of untrustworthiness, even if there's a little minute around of, of, of untrustworthiness, there's going to be a connection. And there's going to be a connection with somebody charismatic there. One of those tape replays. Will your life story help somebody else to understand how to proceed? If it was possible to present everything that's came down in the last few years in the proper perspective, it would be advantageous to other people, I would imagine. But if they had eyes in their head and they could see under the bed, they'd see that heads of lead and eyes of wood. It doesn't really matter because rubber fingers is taking the hand off into the universe anyway. level of comprehension that you hold in your mind is only taught to you by a school book that's in a sorority house. My father jumps off the Second World War in the ruptured ducks that were in the little pins and the buttons in Section 8 and the nut wards and all the people that have gone crazy. Your father was crazy? My father was all men that I've ever met in prison. Mel was one of my father's. Creepy Carpus is another. I learned something okay. from everyone. <laughs> the captains, the wardens, I never missed anybody. I learned as much as I could from everybody I could get a hold of. And I've never met anybody that I couldn't learn something from. But now that I have learned what I've learned, I don't think you people want to know what I know. You wouldn't like it. Why? Well, because it's not very nice. Well, why? Because the people that you let run your lives aren't very nice. The people that govern you, the people that tell you people what to do, they're not good people. You've been back on a job out of segregation for how long now? I don't know. I got up and came out of here today. I how long have you been working in the chapel? I explained to you, I live one day at a time. Right. I don't have any other life outside one day at a time. What brought you back into the mainline population? What brought me back into the mainline? The preacher, Mm -hmm. with his love and respect and help, got me back on the mainline. 
after all that years of solitary, all those years of solitary and segregation, how is it? Still right now, I'm doing the same day I've always done. I've just had to bring it a long ways. But it's still today, and it's still a good day. And every day gets a little better. No matter what you do to me. Are you at peace with yourself? <laughs> Whatever that means, I never even thought about to ask myself if I was. I don't generally talk to myself. <laughs> but I guess talking to yourself would be all right. All right, Chase, what do you got? This is great because it helps you to see the cracks in false confidence, fake confidence. There's nodding during the silence after he speaks. The blink rate increases, which is a stress response when he's asked about anything vulnerable. They're smiling when he's nervous. There's an increase in facial touching during these precise moments when he's asked to internally reflect on anything. And this interviewer did a hell of a job. Whoever this guy is, uh, get an A from me. Final thing is uh, incarceration or the next thing here and a lack of positive role models in his life. This is a huge contributor to later in life criminal behavior and activity. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, but he had lots of fathers, we'll find out later. Lots of good influence on him. So, yeah, he's been in prison since he was in the system since he was 10. So that's a bad thing. More importantly to me is, Chase, something you just hit on. We see emotional eye accessing. And when he's asked about solitary and segregation, that's point all this crazy he's going to show you. There's anger in his face as he says, no matter what you do to me. And if you want to know, it's awful hard under all that facial hair to see the anger. But if you see the um, if you see his blink rate increase and then tightening around the muscles in his mouth, pulls his nose down so you can see he's angry. And then he's got that weird little laugh. This is the organism doing what made the organism successful. And he's this is his Fred, um, his Fred act to hide something. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so there's the the preacher there. He talks about that he's been working with with a preacher. My guess is he's picked up some of that preacherness from that uh, charismatic laughter at the absurdity of the situation. I would say these behaviors where you get him being serious and then laughing, that the laughter feels odd to us. We know we're in this in the presence of something that is odd and doesn't quite work. That is behavior that we would call allotropic, which means it pulls you in both directions. It's like a car accident. You can't you know you shouldn't watch but you're drawn towards it. And so everybody slows down on the highway. They know they shouldn't look at it, but at the same time, they're drawn towards it. That's his char charismatic nature. He puts in these little bits of behavior that are out of context, that are super weird. You know you shouldn't join in, but you're kind of drawn towards him. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, I think that mouth fidgeting, again, that's sort of his baseline. You guys covered everything on this, that there's... There's not tons of things to go over, so that's all I, I got on that one. One of those tape replays. You've been back on a job out of segregation for how long now? I don't know. I got up and came out here today. I how long have you been working in the chapel? I explained to you, I live one day at a time. Right. I don't have any other life outside one day at a time. What brought you back into the mainline population? What brought me back into the mainland, the preacher, mm -hmm. with his love and respect and help, got me back on the main line. Mm -hmm. After all that years of solitary, all those years of solitary and segregation, how is it? Still right now, I'm doing the same day I've always done. I've just had to bring it a long ways. But it's still today, and it's still a good day. And every day gets a little better, no matter what you do to me. Are you at peace with yourself? <laughs> Whatever that means, I never even thought about to ask myself if I was. I don't generally talk to myself. <laughs> but I guess talking to yourself would be all right. Let's talk about Helter Skelter. Mm -hmm. Bugliosi paints you as a small, would-be pop singer, as he describes it, of little talent. How do you react to that? Bugliosi looks in the mirror 
every morning when he shaves. And that's the only person in Bugliosi's world, just him. Ask his wife, she knows it. What about the accuracy of the book, though, Charlie? He had the dates right and the names right, but he had a million illusions that had nothing to do with my reality. He was only trying and convicting his own reality. It didn't have anything to do with me. I've already been through all these prisons. But he did paint you as probably one of the most universally known persons. To who? Around. To, to who? readers. People who read it. And they believed it? I don't know. What do you think? Then they're not as good as what they read, are they? But the book, how, how accurate or inaccurate is it? I never read it. Didn't you brief it one time? I read parts of it. Yeah. How did you find it? Like I say, it was reflections of what he was thinking. It had nothing to do with me. Seriously, the Charlie Manson that you created, that's not me. <laughs> that's only an illusion in your minds. It hasn't got anything to do with me. What's the real Charlie Manson? I haven't really been able to make him up, see. I've just been reborn again, see, and I'm learning now. I'm starting all over, and I'm learning. The preacher's teaching me, the teacher's teaching me, the counselor's counseling me, and the doctor's looking out after me. The guards don't bother me that much, and I don't bother them that much. They do their jobs and raise their kids, and I do my job and do what I do for my kids. All right, Mark, what do you got? Well, just one thing, and it's, it's not that difficult to catch because he says, I never read it, and then instantly concedes, well, I read part of it. So it's not difficult to get the truth or, or more accurate with him quite quickly. I mean, you know, potentially psychopathic, you know, super brain in some people's minds, but would a super mind, a super brain really get caught that quickly? No. I mean, it's a little bit, little bit dumb there uh chase what do you got on this one it's a great clip in this one we're seeing known deception when he so we know it's deception obviously and it's immediately associated with a few signs that we commonly see in deception there's facial touching hesitancy eyebrow flash approval seeking uh a, a muted head shake and the behavior toward the end is a great example of list-making behavior, which cult leaders do all the time. They'll just make these random lists of stuff that sound like they're getting smarter. And it kind of causes, I think it does two things to us. It It's a confusion overload to make you more suggestible, and it induces a kind of a trance because we're going along this list. And there's some perceived, maybe some falsely perceived depth and complexity to it. And uh, maybe a little dominance going on there. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. As the questions get, again, closer to who he really might be, they start. he starts zeroing in on the questions. I think the, we're starting to see just a hint of nervousness there. And that's why he's he's getting, he's getting a little animated, a little, a little bit louder. So I agree with you on that. Um, I, and you guys covered, there's not a, tons of stuff up in here, but you've got most of it. Uh, let's see. Greg, what do you got? <laughs> yep, no light. My light just fails. <laughs> we'll see what's going on there. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Number one, his he purses his lips in disapproval at Helter Skelter. Him and Bugliosi have a long-term, long-running hatred, and you see his respiration increase. Then he goes into the best Southern Baptist thing I've heard. There's a mantra there where he says he's, he's going in this whole thing about you know, him being the only person in his world, and then he pauses after he does that little you can hear its cadence is practiced and rehearsed. Ask his wife. Long drawn out thing. So he's drawing in. I said, and I have here. It's a shame Charles Manson was crazy and a criminal because he would have been a good kind of entertaining in front of people guy. His face drops. He looks interview. He looks at the interviewer like he's disappointed because the interviewer did not fall for that hook. That's a provocative statement, and it didn't work. And the guy just moves on. He goes into some other soliloquy. The face touching when he says he never read it, we can all, you know, I won't go into any of that. The best follow-up question ever is what's the real Charles Manson that forces him into introspection, 
He goes down left, down right. This triggers his defense. And then he goes more of this crazy philosophy of madness that he's got. That's just, I, look, all I think it is, is a box of things he's read. You said it. This is David Boy's lyric style. He's got a bunch of lines and he's just piecing them together and hoping they'll stick. He has no idea what most of them mean when he's doing all this stuff and he gets up and dances around and does all this. It's because that's what's worked for him because he's been hanging around with kids on drugs that he he was feeding drugs and probably controlling every element of their life. And they thought he was some powerful guy and he was introducing them to things that they never had and also introducing them to ways of not having to work and survive. He would steal credit cards and do all kinds of things. So I'm sure he seemed like some kind of a godling to them. But when you get him in the bright light, he's just a miserable little man. One of those tape replays. Let's talk about Helter Skelter. Mm-hmm. Bugliosi paints you as a small would-be pop singer, as he describes it, of little talent. How do you react to that? Bugliosi looks in the mirror every morning when he shaves. And that's the only person in Bugliosi's world, just him. Ask his wife. She knows it. What about the accuracy of the book, though, Charlie? He had the dates right and the names right, but he had a million illusions that had nothing to do with my reality. He was only trying and convicting his own reality. Didn't have anything to do with me. I've already been through all these prisons. But he did paint you as probably one of the most universally known persons. To who? Around. To To readers. People who read it. And they believed it? I don't know. What do you think? Then they're not as good as what they read, are they? But the book, how, how accurate or inaccurate is it? I never read it. Didn't you brief it one time? I read parts of it. Yeah. How did you find it? Like I say, it was reflections of what he was thinking. It had nothing to do with me. Seriously, the Charlie Manson that you created, that's not me. <laughs> That's only an illusion in your minds. It hasn't got anything to do with me. What's the real Charlie Manson? I haven't really been able to make him up. See, I've just been reborn again, see, and I'm learning now. I'm starting all over, and I'm learning. The preacher's teaching me, the teacher's teaching me, the counselor's counseling me, and the doctor's looking out after me. The guards don't bother me that much, and I don't bother them that much. They do their jobs and raise their kids, and I do my job and do what I do for my kids. You know, there was a time a while back where when you got out into the main line, you, you ran into trouble. I remember Bobby Davis up at, up at uh, Folsom. I ran into trouble? Well, you got into trouble. Who told you that? You see what I'm saying? Did it happen? Uh, Did you fight? Many things have happened. No, I didn't fight. Were you fought? Were you, somebody were, come after you? Were I fought? Sure, I've been fought a little many times. Did somebody come after you? Someone come after me? No, someone could come after me if they wanted to. But did they? No, they've always left me here. Nobody wanted me. You haven't had any trouble on the outside? On the, the outside past. where? In prison. In the prison? No, on the population. No, I get along with most of the convicts. The convicts that get along with themselves. There's much harmony in prison. More every day. There's much uh, wisdom in the prison. More every day. Getting back to the book, what is this magnetism that people keep referring to? And it's, it's been beyond that. People writing you, wanting to meet you. Your people that you had in the desert. Mm-hmm. Why what is the magnetism? You, why don't you answer that question? I'm asking that question. Well, can't you see? Well, tell me, what is it? Well, what do you think it is? Do you know? Do you know? Don't play games with me. It's no Seriously. game. I know. That's why. That's why you're asking me questions, and I'm not asking you questions. Okay. You see, I don't need to ask you questions. I already know. Could you tell me? Sure, I can tell you. Do you have the time? I'm here. Who would you like to start? Well, what is it? Go ahead and tell me. What is what? 
Are you secure? Charlie. The government is the United States. The government has never been more secure. Never been more secure than it is right now. Hold the button. Seriously, I, I want to know. All right. Chase, what do you got? I missed the uh, contributing factor in the last video. He was exposed to and explored a lot of the ideas of Scientology earlier on. Mm. And to Scott and Greg, both of y'all, this is the first video I've ever seen in my life where a person goes from, and I may be wrong, a romancer, then to trancer, then to stancer, and then to prancer. <laughs> Maybe y'all can talk about this. This conversation it features several hallmarks of Manson's uh, speech patterns, which were convoluted, circular, nonlinear. And here's uh, maybe what you saw right here. There's repetition and reversal, which is who told you that? Did it happen? Those kinds of questions. There's ambiguity and evasiveness, and it makes stuff difficult to follow. There's an assertion of dominance here. There's uh, hypnotic repetition is what this is called. In preacher speak, this would be called a voice roll. An indirect confirmation here. There's non sequiturs present here. And in general, his this communication style was a crucial part of why he was able to develop followers so quickly inside of this community of wounded, confused people who were going through a, a very difficult time. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really interesting one for me, because if you pay attention, his entire everything he does is to try to get this guy to admit that he came here to find out something that Charles Manson knows that he doesn't. And it doesn't work. And he gets angry. You can see it. He says, I know. And that's why you're asking me. And you can see all that anger in his face, the stuff we always associate, the narrowing of the eyes. And if you don't think that he was trying to work him into that, that's what he's working him to. But go back and listen to him. See his teaching face as he's watching him. He almost cracks a smile when he talks about wis wisdom in prison. You can't miss it. He's got, when he says the word you, when that guy says the word you, all that superficial charm and all that stuff that comes up is there. That's Charlie. That's probably where all of all these kids saw in him. But the minute that he stops admiring him, and th then you see that superficial charm just disappear and drop off. I won't go into all the steps, but he forces a guy to change language so he can pretend not to understand twice. That's powerful when you're trying to negotiate your way through things. But watch him get angry. Watch him have that superficial charm when he says you to Charlie. And then watch him lose that superficial charm, fade, and get angry. It's really powerful. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think we're starting to see the heat being turned up a little bit by the uh, interviewer. This guy, is, he, he's coming on a little bit aggressive. And it's its showing up on uh, Charles. Uh, and now I think the goofing around with his beard, I think that's actually become an adapter now. It was part of his baseline earlier, but now I think he's doing it because he's getting a little, he's feeling a little bit of the tension from that. Um, and I think this is the worst case, worst case we've ever seen of chaff and redirect or an attempt to, in other words, it, it's the worst. It's, it's almost hilarious. That's how bad it is. Um, and so far it's the most movement we've seen on him. And uh, the interviewer is, is is coming in swinging on this one, and Charles is kind of I think he's in a slap fight. Um, is under the impression he's in a slap fight, where the interviewer is under the impression he's boxing. I think it's the differences we're seeing there. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so I think he reveals his his modus operandi here for picking up disciples. Uh, are you secure? He asks. Are you secure? And it's interesting, Chase. I've written underneath there, Scientology, and then Elrod, Elron and Miskovich there. Uh, because, listen, uh, for those of you who know London, you'll know that Scientologists were on um, on Tottenham Court Road, uh, just near Gower Street, and and all the actors would come out of, 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 of RADA, student actors, and they were easy pickings, easy pickings for the, psycho, uh, the, the Scientologists. Um, and, and anybody going up Tottenham Court Road, because you can hit an actor with a bread roll at a... At a at, you know, 10 paces all the time. And there's, there's, there's no group that is often least uh, insecure as actors after an audition, which is you're in the heart of the West End. <laughs> you're just in the heart of the West End. And in the heart of the West End, you've got actors auditioning all the time and they're coming out of theatres utterly insecure with themselves. Good pickings, good pickings for any cult. I'm not saying Scientology is a cult. I'm not saying that L. Ron started a cult and Miskovich uh, runs one right now. I wouldn't say that kind of thing on YouTube. 
uh, that would get me into all kinds of problems, wouldn't it? So I'm not saying that. Uh, but this is the fulcrum of his head game, essentially. You have questions. I have answers. You're insecure. I'm secure. Uh, what a brilliant, what a brilliant, brilliant grift. One of those tape replays. You know, there was a time a while back where when you got out into the main line, you, you ran into trouble. I remember Bobby Davis up at, up at uh, Folsom. I ran into trouble? Well, you got into trouble. Who told you that? You see what I'm saying? Did it happen? Uh, Did you fight? Many things have happened. No, I didn't fight. Were you fought? Were you, somebody were, come after you? Were I fought? Sure, I've been fought on many times. Did somebody come after you? Someone come after me? No, someone could come after me if they wanted to. But did they? No, they've always left me here. Nobody wanted me. You haven't had any trouble on the outside? On the, the outside past. where? In prison. In the prison? No, on the population. No, I get along with most of the convicts. The convicts that get along with themselves. There's much harmony in prison. More every day. There's much uh, wisdom in the prison. More every day. Getting back to the book, what is this magnetism that people keep referring to and it's it's been beyond that people writing you wanting to meet you your people that you had in the desert mm -hmm. what is the you, magnetism why don't you answer that question i'm asking that question well can't you see well tell me what is it well what do you think it is do you know do you know don't play games with me. It's no Seriously. game. I know. That's why. That's why you're asking me questions, and I'm not asking you questions. Okay. You see, I don't need to ask you questions. I already know. Could you tell me? Sure, I can tell you. Do you have the time? I'm here. Who would you like to start? Well, what is it? Go ahead and tell me. What is what? Are you secure? Charlie. The government is the United States. The government has never been more secure never been more secure than it is right now. Hold on, bud. Seriously, I, I want to know. What is it that draws people to you? Music. Motion. Uh, generating. Uh, attention. Reality. Uh, I know. <laughs> when you know, <laughs> you just simply know. Jesus on that cross. You know he's there. Is he there? Is the cross there? I know the cross is there. You don't have to put me on the cross to witness for the cross. I can see the cross. Now what I'm trying to do is get back to earth. So I can go out in the desert. I've already cleaned that thought up once. And you put another president in. But you said and it's people... And every time I clean it up, you put another president in. Uh, all right. you, know? you said it's people who are in harmony with you. What do you mean by that? The people that are in harmony with themselves in the will of a child. The child has a will. You tell the child to come here and the child will walk over. You tell him to sit down and he'll sit down. He's just in the will of the child. God and his children are in the will of a child. <laughs> it's just as simple as the Bible said that you must be as little children before you enter the kingdom of heaven. If the Christians had believed in the Bible, then we wouldn't have all this conflict. But evidently, the only ones that are in conflict now are the Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, like they don't seem to believe in their own God for some reason. I don't know what it is. Maybe they need to see him on the cross again. Or maybe they should uh, uh, pray for him to come out of the sky in a silver uh, uh, platter. Or, you know, I don't know. I'm just here, and you're there. And who is your reality? And where do you get your energy from? And where does your soul flow? And your thoughts? And how do you know you know? Unless you have to come and say, Charlie, How's the Dow Jones? You read the Wall Street Journal? Certainly I read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> I'm right at the top of your brain. And I'll read the Wall Street Journal until you let me walk out that door a free man. Or we'll just use Indian head pennies for earrings. 
All right, Greg, what do you got? So we talked about Merle Haggard's guy in prison, Fred. Well, this is verbal excrement. He's rubbing all over himself, the craziness that keeps people from messing with him. Look, if you're this guy and you've been in jail since you were 10 and you were a little bitty guy and there were people around you who are crazy and violent, you got to figure a way to protect yourself. And that could just simply be, Mark, my note here, you always talk about it, is the uncanny valley. That's the uncanny valley. It almost looks human, but it isn't. That's somebody spewing a bunch of garbage that's rolled around in his head, and he's trying to be something that he isn't. The reason you know that it's an act, like he's off of his rocker, is when he's asked a pinned-down question, he gives a concise answer. And just one other data point about him, he did this thing with all of his kids called creepy crawls, where he would go in the houses of these people he knew who were wealthy, and while they were sleeping, rearrange their furniture. One of those, I think, was um, somebody from Mamas and Papas who said that he it just creeped them out. But she thought it was him training people for the later violence that he would do. This guy had a clear mind on what he was after. Anyway, it goes to that ramblings it, that if if you're sitting like us, you're thinking that's stupid. But imagine if you're sitting there and this guy's talking to you and he's got control over your life. Then he goes to chaff and redirect and he starts talking about Christianity and this Indian head earrings. All that stuff is just him with a Darth Vader costume on. The problem with that is we'll see him as he progresses in life. He's been in, he's been uh, incarcerated in he, he's been isolated. He's been in in solitary. And the problem with that is when you keep rolling that stuff over and over and over, the more times that you're this guy, the less times you're going to be the other guy. And neural paths create. So all kinds of things happen when you put people in isolation. We know that if you leave people in absolute isolation, they get psychotic because things come come unclued because they have no outside inputs. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, in the right context, that enigmatic one-man band that he was doing there would be <laughs> would be incredible. But in the context here, it just looks like a bit of a nutter, you know? And that's the problem is, is that, you know, he's doing what made him great in one context, and in this context, it's just not working for him. What a mashup. Ontology, epistemology there, psychology, philosophy, theology. You've got, you know, the 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 study of 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 why we're here, the study of of how we know what we know, but it's all mashed together in such a way that it absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. He's co-opted the icons of lots and lots of stuff and then just mashed it all together. It's kind of Brad Pitt in 12 Monkeys, kind of barnstorming performance going on here, but in utterly the wrong uh, context. Uh, But what we do see there, I think, which is really accurate, is the Messiah complex, the idea that he is here to save everybody my, I would imagine he truly believes that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Manson's got a really simple technique here. Here it is. Every one of his techniques all rolled into one little formula. Create doubt, insert confusion, amplify confusion, borrow from authority, and use tact, uh, tactical wisdom or artificial wisdom is what I would say. And, which is almost what I would call the Manson formula for how he got to the point of fame that he actually did. And the Manson formula would just be create mystique, offer individualized attention, display uh, assertive confidence, distort reality, promote the us versus them mentality, align with spiritual or ideological concepts. And there you go. You're done. That's all I got. Scott, right. what do you got? I'll go next. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he thought of it that way. I think he did all right up on those things by accident. I don't think, oh, yeah. you know, to be in many books like that. But I, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think he ran up on this by accident because watching this video, that's how you do it right there. This is how it's done. Check this out. You go in when you're dealing with someone who's either they're on drugs or they're really insecure. You catch them at a, at, a, at a spot where they're really vulnerable. And the people that he's dealing with, obviously, are fairly vulnerable because of where he's finding them and how he's running into them, runaways, things like that. So what you do is, when you put them in these, in these situations where they feel even more vulnerable as well, you separate them from their families, those types of things, and you start talking about all these things. You start pulling all these things from different philosophies. And some things are going to ring a bell with you. Some things are going to sound familiar. You talk about Jesus, you talk about the government, you talk about these other things. And out of all this stuff, all of this shotgun blast of things going on, he's gonna there's gonna be one or two things that that will resonate with you. And you'll go to that and try to figure out what he's talking about and say, how does that make sense in this? 
when you start thinking about that, it's too late. When you try to chase that down, you go, oh, wait, what? That makes sense. Because once that happens, you're in. Because then you start connecting all this weird stuff he's talking about. It will make sense to connect together because of the way it's being presented and the way your brain is putting it together. So just like you see clouds and say, oh, look, it's a duck or that's my, you know, that's my grandmother or whatever it is in the clouds, you'll start being able to piece these things together and it will make sense to you. That's how they do it. This is a great example of how he's doing that, getting up, moving around the chair and all that, starting all that. And you're thinking, ah, that sort of throws you off. But when he starts throwing those other things out and you start collecting them and trying to make them work, you can make you can make anything connect when you think about it. You can make you know anything connect, and you do in this case or in this situation. That's how he's doing it, is going ahead and 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 connect making helping you to connect this that he's talking about. And it all of a sudden, boom, it becomes, oh, I get it now. And then once you say that, or once you I do understand, that's when it comes in when and and makes you feel good about what you're doing and what you're saying and where you are and all that. The only problem is that we are not cloistered. When you're cloistered, it works wonderfully. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's like the flat earthers on YouTube. A whole yeah. bunch of other things on YouTube, man. A whole How long bunch have you been a flat things. earther, Chase? How long have you been a flat earther? 18 months, but uh, we haven't had a meeting yet. Or they, well, I mean, that's the thing. You won't find it. You'll get the email soon because it's a 24 months where you we indoctrinate you and you become, you know, can't talk anymore about it here, obviously. But uh, yeah, I, I can't get the T-shirt. People go, people go think we're flat earthers. Well, I think Greg is not us. One of those tape replays. What is it that draws people to you? Music. Motion, uh, generating, uh, attention, reality. Uh, I know <laughs> when you know, <laughs> you just simply know. Jesus on that cross, you know he's there. Is he there? Is the cross there? I know the cross is there. You don't have to put me on the cross to witness for the cross. I can see the cross. Now what I'm trying to do is get back to earth so I can go out in the desert. I've already cleaned that thought up once. And you put another president in. But you said And every time I clean it up, you put another president in. Uh, You You said it's people who are in harmony with you. What do you mean by that? The people that are in harmony with themselves in the will of a child. The child has a will. You tell the child to come here and the child will walk over. You tell him to sit down and he'll sit down. He's just in the will of the child. God and his children are in the will of a child. <laughs> it's just as simple as the Bible said that you must be as little children before you enter the kingdom of heaven. If the Christians had believed in the Bible, then we wouldn't have all this conflict. But evidently, the only ones that are in conflict now are the Christians. Mm-hmm. You know, like they don't seem to believe in their own God for some reason. I don't know what it is. Maybe they need to see him on the cross again. Or maybe they should uh, uh, pray for him to come out of the sky in a silver uh, uh, platter. Or, you know, I don't know. I'm just here, and you're there. And who is your reality? And where do you get your energy from? And where does your soul flow? And your thoughts? And how do you know you know? Unless you have to come and say, Charlie, how's the Dow Jones? You read the Wall Street Journal? Certainly I read the Wall Street Journal. (laughs) I'm right at the top of your brain. And I'll read the Wall Street Journal until you let me walk out that door a free man. Or we'll just use Indian head pennies for earrings. What if you did get a parole date in November? What would you do? Then I would give it some serious thought. I don't have room in my mind for could-be's. I have to deal in what is. I can't think about what I want. I have to deal with what I'm allowed to have. What if you got a date? If I got a date, then I would probably have a date. Do you know what you'd want to do? 
Uh, yes, I have many plans. A lot of plans. I'd like to clean up the water. I'd like to go up in the mountains and start at the top of the mountains and clean the springs up. Take all the pollution out of the water so I could drink it. Clean up all the green things and pick up all the old beer cans and clean all the way to the ocean. And then maybe we might be able to save a little air and water for our children. Because I'm living in my child's world now. I'm working on his world. My world already went to the gas chamber. What if you don't get a date? If I don't get a date, then I won't have a date. Have you thought about it, then? Uh, I know you want to get a date, but what if you it, don't? I gave it some thought, but not that much. I have gave it thought in relation that it's possible that they'll be pushed to make some sort of move to alleviate the pressure that they've created on themselves. Uh, if there's any way that I could help that, I would, then that way I could achieve what I'm after also. All I want is what the Constitution said I could have. The liberty and the right to look for my freedom the way I want. If you gave the Constitution to me like you said you were supposed to, then I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't have been here in the last 11 years. But if you let your politicians play like they're Christians and use your courtroom to further their own purposes, then all you're doing is big business with your own children's lives. And it really doesn't make sense to me, but I don't have the president's spot to make any change. If I had the control to make the change, I have. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things here. Uh, clean up the water. He's going to clean up the water. That's a messiah complex. So I can drink it. That's paranoia. So two things together. Messiah complex and paranoia. That's a that's a lovely cocktail. Um, but he doesn't attach feelings to the events. If I can't get a date, then I won't have a date. Okay, that's just an event with a, a non-event happening. What we want to hear from somebody on the whole is if I can't get a date, you know, I'll be disappointed or I'll be upset, but he doesn't have, it would seem, any of those feelings. Or if he does, he's not going to talk about those. That's not, that's abnormal. That's antisocial. Um, uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? I, I think it's something else, Mark. I think it's learned behavior. When you've been incarcerated for 37 of your 47 years, you learn not to get excited about things because then they're not touchable. And I think in here, in this case, he is actually giving us some real answers because he's adapting and moving to get comfortable. There are large illustrators, got a lower lip withdrawal at what I'm allowed to have. He doesn't use that weird smile he's always using. He compresses his lips tightly. When they ask him what he would do if he does get out, just before he does that beauty pageant answer, he does some emotional eye accessing. What? How do I say this? He, he has to do his Messiah complex because that's just part of who he is. But I think here there's a whole lot. This is a hot topic for him when he goes into that. Uh, when he's talking about my world died with the gas chamber, this is my child's world. I think there's actually some real emotion there when he thinks about it. And it's a hot topic. Um, I, I think later in life, what we're seeing here is probably more of him than we see any other time. I think he became the performing chump by the time Geraldo came along and those guys. And he was expected to be the spectacle. And he does become a spectacle. Scott, you said earlier, this is probably one of the more normal interviews I've ever seen him do. Chase, what do you got? When he when he talks about wanting to clean up the water and pollution, I think he means it. I think uh, if he got released, he would start trying, at least trying to do some of that stuff. And He's a really emotional response here about getting the parole date. And toward the end, when he's talking about politicians and courtrooms, way more confident. This is great because we can see there's a difference between his persona and the person inside that persona who's afraid to be seen. And I believe that understanding the individual motivations, fears, desires, all that kind of stuff, like uh, probably everybody, but Greg and I, mostly are always talking about how did this thing get born? How did this thing get created? While 
this book right here is not the gospel, even though it's so cool, it can make its own baby here that you can carry in a lab coat. The DSM, this is where we diagnose mental disorders, can provide some valuable insight. It should not be used as a definitive guide to understanding behavior. We're different creatures. Labels, diagnostic ones, can sometimes be useful, especially for prescribing medicine with your insurance company, can tend to lead to stigma that limits our understanding of the uniqueness of human beings and also create some self-fulfilling prophecies when people start to do that. So we see some delusions. We see some antisocial personality stuff. Humans are different. That's all I got. Scott? All right. This whole thing is about him. He says, I, 31 times. And he wants to clean up the water and all that for himself. And it's, did you hear him say that? I want to do it for me. You know, in other words, for me. So I think this is all about him. And I think this is, we're just seeing the, the all about him personality, the narcissistic personality come take take over here. I don't I don't think there's much to this guy. I don't think there's much here. I don't and I don't think he would have done that, Chase. I don't think he would I think he would I think he's just talking. I think he just ran across his mind. What would you do if you got out? Eh, I'd help people. You know what he, he could have said, I'll put everybody in the dumpster. And it, you, you we would have seen it the same way. It was just it's all about him. One of those tape replays. What if you did get a parole date in November? What would you do? Then I would give it some serious thought. I don't have room in my mind for could-be's. I have to deal in what is. I can't think about what I want. I have to deal with what I'm allowed to have. What if you got a date? If I got a date, then I would probably have a date. Do you know what you'd want to do? Uh, yes, I have many plans, a lot of plans. I'd like to clean up the water. I'd like to go up in the mountains and start at the top of the mountains and clean the springs up, take all the pollution out of the water so I could drink it, clean up all the green things and pick up all the old beer cans and clean all the way to the ocean. And then maybe we might be able to save a little air and water for our children. Because I'm living in my child's world now. I'm working on his world. My world already went to the gas chamber. What if you don't get a date? If I don't get a date, then I won't have a date. Have you thought about it, then? Uh, I know you want to get a date, but what if you it, don't? I gave it some thought, but not that much. I have gave it thought in relation that it's possible that they'll be pushed to make some sort of move to alleviate the pressure that they've created on themselves. Uh, if there's any way that I could help that, I would, then that way I could achieve what I'm after also. All I want is what the Constitution said I could have. The liberty and the right to look for my freedom the way I want. If you gave the Constitution to me like you said you were supposed to, then I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't have been here in the last 11 years. But if you let your politicians play like they're Christians and use your courtroom to further their own purposes, then all you're doing is big business with your own children's lives. And it really doesn't make sense to me, but I don't have the president's spot to make any change. If I had the control to make the change, I have... So if I can get comfortable here, I might be able to sit all the way down. Uh, you know, we were talking about this. The book Helter Skelter. Right. You said that there are a lot of things wrong with it. What's wrong with it? Well... The book's all right. Got good paper and all that. All this paper comes from trees. It's a shame to waste all your trees writing this trash for your children to be raised up in. 
Do you want your children to live according to the gospel of Helter Skelter? Where are the inaccuracies in it? Well, it would take me as long as it took him to point them out. It took him uh, two years in court to invent them. It would take me two years in court to uninvent them and redo them and show their proper perspective of it. Bugliosi. Yeah. Helter Skelter simply means confusion. And if you don't see the confusion in the world, there's always been confusion in the world, uh, then I guess you don't know what confusion means. But like, I get out of jail, and every time I get out of jail, society's moving a little faster, and they're doing crazier things, and uh, I get out and I can never adjust to it outside because it's, uh, it's uh, almost impossible to do anything right. Everything is wrong to somebody. I mean, you, can't, uh, you have to hide and you know, day people and night people and everybody all divided up. And... All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, there's more rational thought. Right? And if this guy can be rational at times, it's likely he is clear. And when rational is a relative thing, so let me just say that. I don't mean that the way he thinks is the way I think or you think. But look at him lean in and look under his brow at the pronunciation of helter skelter. He's actually mocking there about like, look, I was going to rule the world with this little thing. But then he tells us why he is who he is. I mean, if you want to hear a guy tell you why he is who he is, here it is. Every time I get out, things are different. I don't know how to live, so I have to take what I already know and apply it to the new world. Everything I know, I learned from these men who were in prison. He has to learn a new way to cope on those criminal underpinnings and use his background. And he, there, Chase, you may know this, but there are at least two references to him being involved with an LSD program through Haight-Ashbury that was tied back to the CIA and the MK Ultra program. So he has a good reason not to trust the government if that's the case. And there's actually a study, and I have it, I can put it in the link down below, written about him and his communal marriage that was published in lots of papers. So look, the guy was important enough for people to know him. He knew a lot of famous people. Neil Young said he had talent. Other people said he didn't. So if that guy has no way of understanding the world and he gets out and he can do anything that he wants to because nothing he does is right, he just told you why he is who he is. He told us the formula that created him and why he is who he is. Very clear. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just one thing here, which I really like. You know, Manson's there, you know, messing around with his glasses, you know, trying to put his attention there, distracting uh, into that. And the interviewer does a a toss of the book towards him, makes a big, loud noise, and it does get his attention. So a great example there. The interviewer gets his attention later on as well, just by going, Charles and and or oh, Charlie, I think he uses Charlie and and grabs his attention with that. So the interviewer is learning along the way how to get this person's attention and how this person will try and distract off into his you know twelve monkeys world of barnstorming physicality. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? We hear this line here: society is moving a little faster, and thing uh, they're doing crazier things boy did he nail that or what he nailed that line uh, but it's the same stuff as most of the guilty people we've ever analyzed inability to call somebody a liar vague ambiguous language there's a lack of denial about the accusations attacking the other side there's stress around vulnerability artificial smiling approval seeking behavior and rapport building behavior and it, he, I just think he's delusional. And Jeff Gwynn is an author who wrote this book, uh, which I think is just called Manson, The Life and Times yep. of yep. Charlie Manson or something, details uh, this critical turning point in 1957 after he stole a car, he was put in prison. He took a special class of Dale Carnegie's and read the book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And one of the special things that he took from that class, and he remembers other people, him quoting this line all the time, let the other fellow think, or no, let the other fellow feel that the idea is his. That was a huge turning point for Manson. Greg? Uh, Scott? Okay. Um, I'm going to keep this super short. I don't think he read the book. I think he looked at it and thumbed through it, but I don't think he sat down and read the whole thing. Watch him look through it. 
just does, does, I don't think this guy read this thing. Not that he couldn't. Uh, he can probably read, you know, but I don't, I don't think he read it. That's all I got. One of those tape replays. So if I can get comfortable here, I might be able to sit all the way down. Uh, you know, we were talking about this. The book Helter Skelter. Right. You said that there are a lot of things wrong with it. What's wrong with it? Well, the book's all right. Got good paper and all in it. All this paper comes from trees. It's a shame to waste all your trees writing this trash for your children to be raised up in. Do you want your children to live according to the gospel of Helter Skelter? Where are the inaccuracies in it? Well, it would take me as long as it took him to point them out. It took him uh, two years in court to invent them. It would take me two years in court to uninvent them and redo them and show their proper perspective of it. Bouillosi. Yeah. Helter Skelter simply means confusion. And if you don't see the confusion in the world, it's always been confusion in the world, uh, then I guess you don't know what confusion means. But like, I get out of jail, and every time I get out of jail, society's moving a little faster, and they're doing crazier things. And uh, I get out and I can never adjust to it outside because it's, uh, it's uh, almost impossible to do anything right. Everything is wrong to somebody. I mean, you, can't, uh, you have to hide. And, you know, day people and night people and everybody all divided up. And Just one more thing. All right, what do you think we've seen so far up to this point, Mark? How's it looking to you? Uh, yeah, so uh, Messiah Complex, uh, very, very clear, I would say, from the behaviors that that we're seeing there. Um, and um, genu genuinely paranoid, genuine paranoia as, as well. Um, listen, I, I hear there's other interviews out there uh so you know if you want us to look at some of those other interviews or more of that then put down below what's your what's your most interesting interview and, and why we should uh why we should look at that chase what do you got or the guy's an idiot and don't put that down below because we just may not need to do this again we've kind of got it <laughs> maybe, but maybe not maybe not i agree maybe maybe we're missing out on some big thing that we haven't seen yet one thing that's incredible if you're ever talking to a psycho is to ask them to describe the motivations of other people. That is, in my opinion, one of the most telling and immediately identifiable things because we as humans and even psychos tend to think that all people are essentially like us and that most people process the world like we do. And this is a great window in how he thinks other people operate because it's the way that he operates. And you're going to see this time and time again. You don't even have to ask a psycho. You can ask anybody what they, how they think other people see the world or, or think Greg. Somewhere in America right now, someone else is doing exactly what Charlie did. Some other little petty criminal mind who gets out, who happens to stumble into a place where he can create this environment where he is more alpha than anyone else. And through Maslow's hierarchy of needs and rewarding and punishing behaviors, he's creating his own little monsters. Now, they may or may not have a reason to do revenge for the little monster, but this little broken toy just pulled a bunch of kids around him who had very little tether to something going on in a time when there's massive social upheaval, much like we're dealing with right now. And he was able to find a home for them and even call them family, got them all to use the same jargon, all to feel like the same people, smell like the same people, eat the same stuff, sleep with each other, all of those pieces to create some feeling of belonging and obligation. Guys, this is not the last time we're going to see this. It's simply one time and the most famous because it was in a time when this was not happening much. I think he's just a petty criminal who's just nuts. I don't think he's crazy. I think he's just nuts. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, uh, to sum it up, I think he's an idiot. I don't think he's very smart at all. Going back to what I was talking about earlier, he's just grabbing parts of things he's heard that he thinks sounds like something somebody smart would say, and he just throws them out there and sees what you can gather up. And then, like Chase was saying, put them all together, and you're next thing you know, and like Greg was saying, you're family. You know, so it's just, I don't know. I, I just think he, I think he got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you did all that? I think he got lucky and he became a star, baby. 
<laughs> and he was, you know, as a uh, as a killer. That's what it looks like to me. So, all right, fellas, think this is another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?